highlight of our year for our team. It's extremely motivating to us to welcome you to our campus from all over the world. And uh, you, you know, as you just saw with Earth, we have some new things coming out of the oven just for you that you're going to get to play with first. Um, you're going to hear the same for Earth Engine and with some of our other products. Um, so it's, again, it's highly motivating. And thank you very much for traveling as far as many of you have from all over the world. But more on that later. Um, so the story, people like to know the kind of origin story of how did we all get started. And um, before I go into that, I did want to give an acknowledgment that we are sitting and standing on uh, Ohlone territory, traditional Ohlone land. The Ohlone people lived all over this area of coastal California. Um, and they are still here. Uh, and they have not disappeared. And they are uh, working very hard to secure their rights. So I did want to just take a moment to give acknowledgment and uh, gratitude to the Ohlone people's past and present. Yes. <laughs> So uh, how many of you, I'm just curious, because how many of you have been to Geo for Good before? OK. How many of you have been to two Geo for Goods, three Geo for Goods, four Geo for Goods, oh, wow, five Geo for Goods, six Geo for Goods, oh my god, seven Geo for Goods. Uh, is this our eighth? OK, how many of you, is there anyone here who's been to eight? Oh my god, so talk to those people if you have any questions. They're going to know much more than we will about how this stuff all works and what it's good for. Um, thank you for your uh, persistence or steadfastness. So uh, for those of you who've been here before, you know I like to kind of open, the team likes to open with our origin story, like how did this all get started? And it actually started in a very small way uh, in my community in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And the, it began in 2005, and I used Google Earth as an advocacy tool, an awareness and advocacy tool for our campaign. That is, you know, Google Earth circa 2005, and it was extremely effective. Um, and I've been dying <laughs> to kind of uh, reinvent or retell the story of this campaign to stop the logging of 1,000 acres of redwoods using our new tools. And we're finally at the point where, uh, as you've seen with Gopal and Sean's talk, we're starting to put creation tools uh, in the hands of everyone with our new generation of Earth applications. Uh, so I thought, God, I want to, I wanna, if I were going to do the, the, the logging story now, how would I do it now? So uh, Josh Williams, uh, well, I don't know if he volunteered or he has arm twisted to, because he's one of the most incredible uh, you know, creative people using our, our tools, to see if he could retell the story of the, the Neighbors Against Irresponsible Logging uh, using the new Google Earth. Now, what we're going to show you uses some things that are beyond what's currently available and what Sean and Gopal talked about. So, uh, but it's all running in New Earth, and it does represent um, current features that we have that you'll learn about and some new features that we hope will be coming in a way that will be very easy for people to use and, and create stories with. So let's, let's start. By the way, how many people know this story? I'm just curious, the logging. OK. Um, so. I live at the summit of the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's a very beautiful area. It has the largest remaining stand of old growth redwood in Santa Clara County. Um, one day in 2005, about 2,000 of my neighbors and I received this public notice in the mail, um, notice of intent to harvest timber. Can you read this map? And you're map people, right? Um, my neighbors and I found this a rather challenging map to interpret because it's all black lines. The black lines are supposed to represent the non-industrial timber management plan area where helicopters are going to be landing. Obviously, the roads are on here. 
Very few people could understand this map, so most people threw it out. Maybe that was the point. Um, but I was kind of a map geek, and this tool, Google Earth, had just come out in, in June of 2005. This was August and September 2005. And I thought, you know, we didn't even know whether to be worried or not. It sounded ominous, notice of intent to harvest timber, but we didn't know how worried we should be. Is it going to be uh, very invasive? Is it going to be in some remote area? So I thought, I'll try this new, this new thing at that time, Google Earth, which allowed you to overlay your own information and see if we could get a better perspective on what was at stake uh, by overlaying the data on high resolution 3D satellite imagery. So here we are in the new Google Earth telling the story. Um, so the first thing I did is I studied that map intensively. Then I went to our imagery in Google Earth and I started bringing in layers of the plan, the proposal. And when I did that, it was already starting to be worrisome. It seemed much larger and closer to where people lived than, uh, than we might have expected. The plan indicated in sort of tiny print on page, you know, 309, that there were going to be helicopters landing and taking off in, you know, in perpetuity. Uh, going over this logging plant because the land was too steep to, in general, carry out logs by, by the roads. Uh, and so using SketchUp, I brought in this SketchUp model to show where uh, helicopters were going to be landing and taking off right next to the schools, the daycare center, um, and so on. That was worrisome. Again, it sort of gives a perspective. The plan uh, stated that there were no endangered species, there were no conservation concerns at all, and that they had done a rigorous analysis and, and survey and there were no problems. Well, if you look at the California Diversity Database, it had all kinds of sightings in this, uh, in this watershed of uh, endangered red-legged frogs, nesting osprey, um, all kinds of creatures. And so, again, uh, Google Earth allows you to bring this data in and overlay it. And so I did that uh, in the places where those sightings had been done. And in particular, um, Charlie the beaver and his family. So it turns out there's a family of beavers that live there. One of my neighbors would continually get great photographs of them. And uh, on the basis of all of this looking at the plan, which I did present at community meetings, and it did galvanize the community now that we understood how the kind of proximity of this uh, increase in fire danger causing problems for sedimentation in our drinking water supply, which was for all of the people in the mountains and 100,000 people in Silicon Valley. All these, all these issues were much more obvious public safety issues from this plan. So as we organized, we said, OK, we need a mascot. And we decided it should be Charlie the beaver, because beavers are responsible loggers. <laughs> and the name of our group was Neighbors Against Irresponsible Logging, right? Because, you know, truly, I mean, we all use wood derived products and we have to be thoughtful about that. Uh, but there is sustainable and unsustainable, or responsible and irresponsible. Um, another factor in all this was right adjacent to this land that was going to be logged in perpetuity was the Sierra Azul Open Space Preserve. So I brought in the GIS data for that and overlaid that. And you can just see how it's the, those yellow lines are the trails. There's, there's a lot of recreation that goes on there. There were going to be conflicts there as well, right, between recreation and this uh, industrial logging plan. Just to sort of ground this so you know I'm not making this up, this is a picture from like 2005. That's Google Earth circa 2005 and Rebecca circa 2005. I was thinking it'd be great if we could let technology advance, but we could kind of park people, you know, <laughs> where they were. But uh, I ended up, uh, after I presented to the community, I was asked by the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, San, San Jose Mercury News Editorial Board, uh, you know, uh, Sierra Club, like dozens of organizations asked me to present the Google Earth logging flyover because that was how they felt they were getting a better perspective on the plan. So it ended up uh, 
that we got, started getting a lot of attention for the use of Google Earth technology in, in saving the redwoods. Um, activists started Googling, Internet Maps Illustrate Environmental Woes. I thought, I thought this was a good title by um, San Francisco Chronicle. Desktop satellite tools are changing the way environmentalists work. My feeling was it's leveling the playing field. It's putting very powerful information in the hands of grassroots environmental activists that uh, normally would not be available. And this one was in the Santa Cruz Sentinel, empowering public participation with Google Earth under internet and democracy. And I, I really like that because I started to feel that that's what was happening, that this was a new tool to bring transparency and awareness to an important public issue that otherwise would have very likely just gotten rubber stamped because that was typically what happened. It was also um, after I created uh, an animation going up the canyon uh, using Google Earth, uh, CBS Evening News uh, decided to put it on TV. Well, tonight a battle is brewing in the South Bay over plans to log a thousand acres of land. Tony Russomano shows us exactly what's at stake. We're taking a Google Earth virtual flyover along the five-mile <laughs> length of Los Gatos Creek between Lexington Reservoir and Lake Elsman in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The area in red, totaling a thousand acres, is land that San Jose Water Company wants to log. The map was created by a software engineer who lives in the area, and it's being used to galvanize opposition to the company's plan. Yeah, um, and again, look at this. You can see how close the logging would be to all of these parts of our community. And it really revealed that this is an industrial logging plan that uh, was attempted to be presented as uh, something much more modest. So long story short, it took two years. But we used Google Earth not only to reveal uh, and help people understand different serious issues associated with the plan, but eventually we used it to prove, in fact, that the plan was illegal and did not even qualify for consideration. Uh, and so uh, uh, September 2007, 12 years ago, we won a great victory where the plan was officially denied. Woohoo! And uh, yeah, the, the reporters were saying environmentalists used to sit in trees, now they sit in front of Google Earth. <laughs> the last, the last uh, kind of a epilogue to this, which is really exciting, is uh, remember that I had the, 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 the water company land in red and the open space in green. Well, now, uh, just a year or so ago, Governor Brown signed a bill that would provide the funding to purchase this land and convert it to permanent protection as open space. And doesn't it just make sense, right? So thank you, Google Earth. All right. Can we switch to slides? All right, so we kind of have different versions of our mission over time. This is our current version of our mission, which is to catalyze geographic data, including Google's uh, data, um, with partners to um, catalyze social and environmental change uh, at, at scale, social and environmental impact at scale. And we do that, you know, we are techno geeks, right? But technology is only ever a part of the solution. Um, and it may be just a small part of the solution. These issues are very complicated. And you need people who understand policy and the on the ground issues and the science and all of that, which is not our specialty. So it's very, uh, this kind of interaction uh, with you, um, you know, nonprofits, scientists, developers using our APIs, educators who are elevating geoliteracy in the classroom, media are using uh, our tools for really bringing awareness to issues uh, in a much more compelling way. We've got an increasing number of government users, local, state, federal, international. Um, and we're working now with sustainability industries that are trying to, to accelerate progress on things like climate action. And we have done a lot of work with indigenous communities, and we value that uh, very much. So 
over th all of these years, we've developed this theory of change. Like, what are the levers of change as we experience them with you? Um, and it's, it comes down to us for like three categories. One is, how can we help together create new knowledge about the world that is profound and is action-oriented? Filling gaps in human knowledge. Um, how can we help you raise awareness of complex, important issues in a way that is uh, compelling and engaging? And then how can all of this, at the end of the day, catalyze action to solve real problems? And kind of some early examples of this that help inform, and we learn more you know, every year, what is the global forest change scientific result that Matt Hansen of University of Maryland derived. Uh, it was our first big global data analysis uh, using Landsat uh, in Earth Engine, the first high resolution map of forest cover and change. On the raise awareness side, um, US Holocaust Memorial Museum built a very compelling uh, KML in Google Earth showing in high resolution imagery more than 1,600 villages that were uh, burnt, uh, destroyed in Darfur and raising global awareness about the genocide that was taking place. And that was featured in the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. And then enabling action, partnerships with um, Environmental Defense Fund, I think they may be here. Um, we instrumented street view cars with air uh, quality sensors. They provided scientists and so on to drive uh, uh, the detection of methane leaks and get them repaired. So that's just a, just a, a few examples. Um, so create new knowledge. You're going to learn, I think a lot of you here are interested in Earth Engine from beginner to expert. Um, this is our major technology for helping generate new knowledge about the planet and how it's changing. Cloud platform for petabyte scale analysis of satellite imagery and other geospatial data. You're going to hear more from Matt Hancher, who is our uh, tech lead manager for that. Fundamentally, at a very high level, it's a massive data catalog that we're updating hourly so that you don't have to if you want to have access to that data online. And then a high performance computation platform to do analysis at scale in space and time. Um, you know, the, the sources of data uh, are, there's amazing public data that's being collected by NASA satellites, European, Japanese, uh, many, many uh, incredible sources of uh, environmental data. But historically, that data has come off those satellites and gone into tapes. This is US Geological Survey in South Dakota, gone onto tapes like in a vault, in a government vault, where it's very secure, which is great, but it hasn't been that accessible. So what we've tried to do with Earth Engine is unlock the value of those pixels by bringing all the data into the cloud and making it available to scientists uh, with, um, through APIs and parallel computation to derive knowledge from that data at scale. Um, there's a whole new kind of um, paradigm that was described by, in this seminal paper, this next generation digital earth, is this very thing, this sort of cloud-based, uh, massive global scale uh, environmental analysis. This is just some visualizations of the Earth Engine data catalog. You know, there's, there's satellite uh, imagery, satellite data, uh, weather data, elevation, demographic information, raster imagery, and vector data. Um, just in the last year, we've uploaded 120 data sets. That may not sound like a lot, but in many cases, those are ongoing feeds. So we've built kind of a pipeline that we're going to update that. Anytime that updates, we're going to update that in the catalog for you. Uh, a, a petabyte per month we're adding to the public data catalog, uh, 14 petabytes just this year. Um, yeah, the total we have is now uh, more than 30 petabytes, I believe. Another uh, thing you're going to learn a lot more about uh, that we're super excited about is the integration of Google Earth Engine with the C Google Cloud AI platform. We really think that's where a lot of innovation is going to come with this integration of the um, geospatial data catalog, the geospatial data analytics, together with deep learning, neural networks, modern machine learning. Um, and you're going to learn more about that. 
But just kind of as a teaser of the kind of areas where we think it will have broad applicability would be, you know, uh, high resolution, um, temporally frequent land cover maps of the entire planet, right? Because knowing the land cover of the planet is kind of the base map for many actions, whether it's conservation, human development, and so on. Very important to, to government, um, you know, there's, it's, whether it's climate, uh, conservation of ecosystems, water, uh, there's many different um, types of land cover classification and the impact of knowing uh, that data. So we did a first kind of prototype um, that you can check out, um, Project Earth, I think it's called, and it is uh, a global annual from 2013 to 2018 multi-class land cover map using Earth Engine plus deep learning um, and 80% average accuracy, which is actually good for a multi-class land cover map, uh, but we have aspirations to get that much better. So that's just a teaser. Um, meanwhile, there's a tremendous amount of science being done with Earth Engine. Uh, if you put all that data and all that computation in the hands of the world's leading geoscientists, it's amazing what they do. So there's tons and tons of papers coming out. There's entire journal uh, issues dedicated now. There's been three of them already dedicated to Earth Engine powered uh, applications. Um, and yeah, we have more than uh, 115,000 scientists right now. These publications that you're producing are in the top journals in the world. One, a couple things that I'm just highlighting that, that have come out in the last year. Um, the folks from uh, Severe and Silvacarbon um, published the SAR handbook, and this is being used in many countries in the world, and it heavily references Earth Engine. Uh, there's an advance in wildfire monitoring using Earth Engine that uh, typically wildfire monitoring is done using one or at most two data sets, but because Earth Engine brings it all together for you, this advance uses Landsat and Sentinel and MODIS fused together to produce a more accurate and timely result. Um, similarly with flood exposure, um, the, just the availability of this data uh, expedites that. There's been almost 4,000, uh, according to Google Scholar, which presumably is not biased, but uh, <laughs> we didn't pay our friends at Google Scholar to like, you know, um, but yeah, that, that almost 4,000 papers that have referenced Earth Engine. And the community, as you can see, it's just really been exciting to see the adoption. Uh, this is going back about since our launch in 2010 to see the accelerating adoption of this platform. So raising awareness. Um, so now imagine you have a lot of good data. Well, what do you do with it? So time lapse is a product that we've built uh, but you know, you're gonna be able to do the same, which is um, creating an animation of the changing surface of the planet in a way that's easily browsable on web and mobile. Uh, earlier this year, we did launch the mobile client working with our partners at Carnegie Mellon. Um, you should really check it out, it's amazing, time lapse. Um, Earth Voyager is our digital magazine of the planet. Um, we originally filled it with kind of stories uh, about, uh, you know, interesting events and so on. Uh, but now we're adding things like guided tours, data visualizations. Um, it's going to become much more of an atlas, I think, over time, in addition to stories. Uh, National Geographic published an, an amazing story about the Okavanga Delta that I encourage checking out. Um, if any of you are fans of Carmen Sandiego, you need to check out the Carmen Sandiego quiz in Earth Voyager. Uh, it's popular in schools. Test yourself in your geography. It's harder than you might think. All right. Um, data layers, right? Uh, over time, we expect that people will not just use these and view these, but they'll be integrating them in their stories, in their analysis, and so on. Um, we've also recently launched uh, near real-time animated clouds uh, in Earth which is a very, very beautiful thing to see. It's, I think, the last 24 hours, uh, updated every 10 or 15 minutes, something like that. 
again, we're, we're trying to head toward this like living, breathing, animated, like Earth Live, uh, Earth Now experience. Um, we think it's really important, given the reach uh, and the platform that we have, to try to avoid leaving people behind and, in fact, to proactively try to reach to underrepresented communities and make sure their stories and information are told to our global audience. Um, in particular, a lot of work that Raleigh's been leading, working with indigenous communities. Many of you, uh, you know, a number of you are here. A recent really exciting launch at the UN was uh, celebrating indigenous languages in Voyager. There is our very own Raleigh speaking at the UN uh, about this project uh, in August. She did very well. And it's, it's brought a lot of reaction, a lot of positive reaction and engagement from, uh, from around the world. So uh, there's a number of folks that have reached out and said, could you add this language? Could you add that language? And so we expect this to be a living project. Um, it's also being used in the classroom. When we speak about you know, inclusion and so on, um, what we came to understand was Google Maps is kind of a de facto base map for the world. We have more than a billion users. So if we leave indigenous territories, you know, Native American, Native territories, First Nations, if we leave them off the map, we are excluding them in a very you know, profound way. And so again, Raleigh's led work uh, to bring um, this um, data into our maps, uh, um, and that is opening up a lot of value and awareness. Okay, another tool, just briefly, is Earth Studio, which is getting more and more powerful, and that is letting you create, uh, control the camera in a very detailed way through our 3D imagery and export a video. Um, and it's being used by the New York Times, by filmmakers. Uh, the New York Times won uh, a Pulitzer for their interactive reporting of a story embedding the output of uh, Earth Studio. Um, the, the, uh, documentary Free Solo, I'll just bring this up, um, used Earth Studio for their pre-planning and production because you can take our 3D imagery and you can over annotate it. Um, that was kind of a fun project. But think about it as this is not about climbing El Cap. This is about how would you want to annotate our 3D imagery with your data and tell a story with it. Enable action. Um, Earth Engine apps, we, we, our goal was to make it much simpler once a scientist, once someone has developed uh, um, a methodology in Earth Engine, uh, how can they transition that into operational use in the real world? Because all the data, all the algorithms, all the computing is all sitting in the cloud, it's, the data is being updated you know, perpetually, it makes it much easier for someone to graduate from uh, a result and a paper to someone actually using it, whether it's government, NGO, and so on. Um, so there's been many, many, many incredible Earth Engine apps that people are publishing. Um, and you're going to learn uh, if you go to the session, I think it's on Wednesday, um, there's a really great one on uh, conservation planning um, and looking at where uh, under climate change, business as usual, as expected scenarios, where is habitat going to shift, and therefore, where do we need to be proactive in setting conservation targets? Um, then there's projects that we get more deeply involved in, and there's a set of these uh, you know, related to monitoring global air quality, uh, uh, estimating solar potential of, of 170 million rooftops in the world, uh, estimating carbon emissions due to transportation in buildings and putting that in the hands of cities. Global Fishing Watch. There's, we have chosen a small set of very serious global issues where, we're, where we are working closely with a number of partner organizations to try to move the needle on those. Um, global Fishing Watch is a fantastic example bringing transparency to global fishing. More than 20% of seafood caught today is caught illegally or uh, unsustainably. Um, this project has really taken off in terms of adoption by uh, you know, Indonesia, Peru, um, three of the top fishing nations in the world have committed to using it and using it transparently. And where the rubber meets the road is this data is being used to um, implement actions like setting aside 
marine protected areas uh, where the, the planners can thoughtfully understand how can they p create an area of protection that minimizes impact on the fishing industry. It can, you can make those trade-offs based on very deep, uh, very deep data. I mentioned Project Airview. We, uh, EDF said, would you please, you know, if you're driving around anyway, why not put uh, you know, air quality sensors on your cars? And Karen listened to them, and hence uh, we've been doing that. Um, uh, very interesting results Sh turn out, this was driving all over Oakland, that there's a lot of environmental justice issues revealed. You can have extreme differences in air quality from one end of, of a block to another. So when you do this hyper-local air quality assessment, um, it reveals a lot. Uh, and in fact, there was a paper published finding correlation between the black carbon data results uh, found by this project Airview and where there were adverse health issues. Um, now remember I mentioned overlaying data using Earth Studio. This is an example um, of taking the Airview uh, air pollution data uh, collected by the Street View cars overlaying it on Earth and using Earth Studio to create a fly-through. I personally think it's a beautiful thing. And are you guys, would you be interested in something like this? OK. Yeah, I mean, because we do have, it's acknowledged to be the best imagery in 3D data in the world. And it's a fantastic canvas for um, creating context and awareness around issues. The Environmental Insights Explorer is our tool uh, for putting climate action relevant data in the hands of cities who've taken, 10,000 cities have taken a pledge to reduce their carbon emissions, uh, but most of them do not even have the baseline data to get started. They don't know their emissions due to transportation or due to their buildings. We have Google Maps data that actually helps us derive that for them and we're giving to them for free um, and helping them not only take a baseline but to plan actions and then track progress over time. For example, um, this is a data visualization of the solar potential of uh, roofs. And we take into account shading and time of day and latitude and weather and, uh, and give, a, give a data point for uh, every 10 centimeter square um, over the course, average over the course of a year. Here is, we're looking at uh, London over the course of a day. This is like the data um, for each roof uh, over the course of a day. I think that makes sense. Um, so again, we aggregate this up. We aggregated the city level. We put it in the hands of uh, cities. We've started with a small number. We're expanding it over time. Eventually, we want to get to thousands of cities who need this information because that can ultimately uh, could move the needle on a billion tons of carbon by 2025, which would be a meaningful uh, carbon reduction. Um, the city of San Jose is a poster child for using our solar data. They, through our data, they learned that they have, um, on 200,000 plus roofs, they have the ability to generate 3.4 gigawatts of clean, renewable solar energy. They had no idea that that was the case. And so armed with that data, they made a pledge they want to be the first gigawatt solar city in the US. Um, getting back to the science turning into action, many of you may be familiar with the Hansen paper, the global forest, the high resolution global maps of forest cover and change. That has more than 4,000 citations at this point. Um, it's being used in a number of action oriented settings, uh, most notably Global Forest Watch, many of you may be familiar with. Um, Earth Engine continues to power the annual update of that and the weekly update of the, of the uh, GLAD alerts, the deforestation alerts um, on a regular basis. That data and Earth Engine were then used to um, track uh, tiger conservation areas um, and what could there be, um, given the amount of habitat that was remaining, is there sufficient habitat that if protected could enable doubling of tiger, tiger population by 2022, which is a global goal. And in fact, yes, they figured that out at high resolution using uh, Earth Engine. They said, yeah, it used to take them about a year and a half to do the, these estimates. And now they can do it in less than a week using Earth Engine because of the parallel computation. 
Um, that is now leading, that same group is now proposing this kind of audacious but impressive and I think very compelling uh, global deal for nature where 50% uh, or 30% of nature would be set aside of land, habitat, land and water would be set aside by 2030 uh, for conservation and also for nature-based solutions to climate change. If you wanna learn more about that, let's go. We do not have a working, do we have any other uh, clickers? Thank you. Do we know that it works? This global deal for nature really wants your attention. <laughs> okay, uh, so there is a site where you can go and learn more and get, get involved if you want to. There's gonna be a talk about this again uh, on, I think it's Wednesday. Um, the European Commission Joint Research Center did kind of a similarly awesome to the forest one by Hansen, an awesome water um, measurement uh, and statistics over 30 years, 30 year history of water on the planet. That was published in Nature. Uh, but again, in terms of driving to action, this is one of the key sustainable development goals, 661, is 40% you know, of the people in the world do not have uh, reliable access to clean water and this data can help address that and close that gap. We worked with UN Environment and the European Commission to turn that um, scientific result into an operational application, uh, providing data to um, the member states, the nations of the world. And going back to like time lapse, so we're looking at an imagery time lapse of Las Vegas, but now we've got the statistics on it as well. Right, and that's what is really relevant for the SDGs. Um, a last example is a paper came out in June, powered by Earth Engine, looking, uh, estimating the suitability of every hectare on the planet for reforestation. Um, and their conclusion was there was almost a billion hectares of available land that could uh, allow the planting of 500 billion new trees capturing 205 gigatons of carbon, a very meaningful amount of carbon reduction. Now, people may debate, you know, this paper, it's science, right? But, um, but I think there's a lot uh, to that paper that's very exciting. So net-net, what we're starting to see with these incredible global scientific results and then turning that into that water, that water SDG 661, that is now the official approved indicator. Earth Engine, this is Earth Engine's first official uh, indicator, you might say, for, for the Sustainable Development Goals, and we think that there are uh, many more to come. Um, so that's our theory of change. One thing just to kind of bring, give you a forward-looking perspective is that we're starting to see Earth Engine and Google Earth and Earth Studio as kind of a suite, um, where you develop some new results in Earth Engine, you visualize it in Earth, you can tell stories around it, then you can create you know, an animated video of it uh, for sharing broadly. Right now, to be very truthful, you have to crawl over a little bit of ground glass to go from one to the other. It's not easy, but if you're extremely determined, you can do it. Uh, and this is the kind of thing, though, where we really would value your feedback over time as to which of these kinds of um, integrations would be most helpful to you, and that helps us prioritize. Last thing I just wanted to mention is our team has expanded. Um, it's really exciting. There's a lot of awareness at Google that the stuff we're doing together actually really matters and is making a difference, and they want us to do more of it. So we are expanding a lot in the social area um, with work, uh, gender equity, and specifically around women's safety. Um, using Google Maps, and I'll say a little bit more about that, and you'll hear more about that this week. Crisis response, which is becoming increasingly important due to the increasing severity of extreme weather events. Um, and then addressing the unaddressed. Millions and millions of people don't actually have an address, and that cuts them off from economic opportunity, educational opportunity, civic engagement. Um, and so this is an open source project that we're involved with. On the crisis side, these things where, um, so, so we're 
We've got part of Google Maps, basically, in our team now, the part that is really not necessarily providing features for a billion people every day, but the things that really matter deeply uh, when communities are vulnerable. And for example, crisis, giving uh, actionable information in the time of a crisis. Um, and then the women's safety is uh, when women take a route, for example, they take a ride share in India they're, or somewhere, and they're afraid, it's first launch in India, but they may not feel safe. What if their route, what if their driver's going off route? Um, and this is a, a very um, efficient way to alert them and give them the opportunity to notify someone very easily. Um, plus codes I mentioned, addresses for everyone. Um, so the last thing is just to mention that we brought two summits together this year, right? We brought the Earth Engine User Summit together with the Geo for Good, and that was done on purpose because we found that more and more Geo for Good people wanted science folks there, and more and more scientists wanted to be able to interact with someone who cared about their work and was gonna actually turn it into action in the real world. And so we're excited to see how you guys feel about this experience, being all together. Um, and again, never be shy about giving us feedback. This is you. Each one of those points of light coming from somewhere in the world to Sunnyvale, to Google campus, is one of you. Um, actually, I like to think about this at the end going the other way, right? <laughs> like you come here and we all learn a lot together and then you go forth and everybody's sort of turbocharged to spread more light. Um, so, yes, I mentioned this. So the thing we always like to say, it's action-packed, eat your Wheaties, you know, there's a, there's a lot to learn, and uh, we're, we're excited that you're all here with us uh, at this summit. Have a great summit. Okay. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for those opening remarks. Uh, if you have questions for Rebecca, just hold them. At our closing session at 3.30 on Thursday, she will be here to answer all of your questions if you still have them after the next four days. Uh, so hold that for them. I really like hard ones. <laughs> Save your hardest ones. Um, and now I'd like to invite Matt Hancher, engineering lead for the Google Earth Suite, which you've been hearing about this morning, to the stage to talk about what's new in Earth Engine. Matt. Thank you, Raleigh. <laughs> all right, uh, so uh, first of all, welcome to sunny California to everyone. Um, it's fantastic to see you all here. This is my favorite week of the year. I've been saying this to the whole team for the last month in anticipation. It's great to see you all in one place. Uh, quick question before I dive in. Uh, who here in this room, just raise your hand, is currently an Earth Engine user? All right, that's more or less what I thought. So this 15 minutes uh, is aimed more or less directly at you. Now, before I dive in there, for those of you who didn't just raise your hand, uh, Rebecca mentioned earlier, Earth Engine is our cloud platform for petabyte scale analysis of satellite imagery and other geospatial data. Uh, and the reason we built this tool was really to democratize the access to petabytes of remote sensing data and the scale of computation that we have easy access to here at Google and that you need uh, in order to be able to analyze that data, make sense of it, and derive insights so that you can spend more time doing great things in the world. That's really what we're all about. And if you haven't been using Earth Engine so far and you are interested in becoming a user, this is the perfect place. Everyone who just raised their hand, that was like 80% of the people in this room, they are question, uh, people that you can ask questions questions of throughout the week, uh, in addition to attending the, by my count, 41 sessions that we have coming up this week uh, that touch on Earth Engine directly or indirectly, many of them uh, taught by Googlers, many of them taught by uh, other people in this room. Uh, and of course, uh, do not forget, if you have specific questions, to go uh, to the ridiculous base camp that we have upstairs uh, throughout the week, uh, where we'll be running Earth Engine office hours. So, uh, it all begins with data. Uh, Rebecca said some of this before. We've got, since the last time we've all been together here, uh, 120 data sets that are either new or updated. We've been moving in data at the rate of about a petabyte per week, or sorry, per month, excuse me, uh, and improving the uh, tools that we have on the web for you to understand and make sense 
of that catalog. A large fraction of that data that's coming in, uh, the biggest single contributor, is Sentinel-2. So uh, this is, of course, the European uh, Copernicus uh, mission's flagship uh, remote sensing tool for imaging the Earth in visible and infrared bands. Uh, and we've done a couple of exciting things recently uh, with this data. First, we've begun uh, pr uh, applying the uh, level 2A, or service reflectance, calibration to this catalog. So we now have the largest uh, catalog easily available of surface reflectance data for Sentinel-2 online, about three million scenes you can play with today and more coming uh, if you want to take advantage of those techniques for removing atmospheric effects. Uh, that's all that much easier to get started with. And the other thing we, that we've been doing is working to bring down uh, the latency of ingestion. So we've been using Sentinel-2, since it is one of our most popular data sets, uh, as uh, a uh, sort of playground for trying out some new techniques behind the scenes to bring the ingestion latency down from a day or two to hours from when the data is available by the provider to when it's available to you uh, in Earth Engine. So watch that space. That's been a top request for a while and something that we're taking very seriously right now. So uh, another very exciting data set that's been uh, coming in waves into the Earth Engine catalog lately has been the corpus of data about the atmosphere and related variables derived from the Sentinel-5P mission. Uh, so I think here we're looking at uh, aerosols, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, ozone, and methane. Uh, these are four of the variables that are being extracted uh, on a uh, ongoing basis from the Sentinel-5P data uh, that are available for your immediate use uh, in Earth Engine. We've been having a lot of fun in some of the projects that Rebecca mentioned, like uh, uh, the Environmental Insights Project, tapping into this data ourselves. Uh, it's really a treasure trove. This is the first time we've had this kind of global systematic ability to understand what's happening uh, with atmospheric pollutants. Uh, and that's all uh, ready for you to play with. A uh, couple other examples of new data sets. We have uh, a bunch of new population-related data sets, updates to the WorldPOP catalog, for example, one of my favorites. And we've also been adding new capabilities for you to bring your own data uh, into the catalog in new ways. A particularly exciting uh, capability that just recently came online is support for geostationary data sets. We don't yet have any of those in the public data catalog. That's coming soon, but you can bring your own uh, into Earth Engine today. Uh, and, of course, beyond just uh, raster or image-shaped data, we've also been working hard on our support for tabular data. So these are a couple of the data sets we've had in the catalog for a while, uh, the World Database of Protected Areas, the EPA Eco Regions. A lot of what we've been working on here has been under the hood, uh, helping improve the scalability and performance of the tools in Earth Engine for manipulating large tabular data sets. Uh, so, for example, uh, as you work with these kinds of data sets, you should find that the uh, ability simply to draw the data on the screen, but also to do more complex operations like join or intersect two type of the data sets have been getting faster and faster, in some cases as much as an order of magnitude or more faster uh, in recent months. This has been an area of active work uh, between us, also the BigQuery team, where you've been seeing another example of large-scale geospatial data processing in Google's cloud. Uh, Underneath all of this is some new capabilities that we have in our database layer for how we store in an efficient manner this tabular data and this geometric data. Uh, we've been rolling that out to our public data uh, sets first, and that'll soon be, coming, uh, and be the default for user-uploaded tabular data as well. So you should see more of those performance improvements rolling out to your own tables fairly soon. Uh, along the way, we've been adding support for things like CSV upload. So sometimes it's not about huge data sets. Sometimes it's about just simple things. Uh, and so CSV upload now works uh, both uh, through the command line tool and the code editor. Uh, and we've been hard at work uh, on building integration more tightly with Sheets. You'll hear a bit about that uh, later uh, this week. Um, so uh, once you've got all this data, we've been working on making it uh, available to visualize and understand in new ways. A bunch of our recent work has been oriented towards visualizing data in time. Uh, the heartbeat of the planet uh, really comes across much more compellingly in an animated form. Uh, this is uh, daily temperature data from GFS in the upper right. You can see the sun sweeping across the Earth, or, or a year's worth of MODIS data. This was last year. You can see this is the Bay Area. You can see the very rare snows pop in just east of here. That was 
was very surreal to see the mountains here uh, snow-capped. Uh, these capabilities uh, are now available. You hear about them throughout uh, a number of the courses uh, for making things like both animated GIFs or also uh, MPEG and time-lapse style uh, full motion video. Rebecca alluded to Earth Engine apps. Uh, this is, of course, a way that you can take those data, those visualizations, those results, and bundle them up into an interactive experience that you can put into the hands of decision makers or stakeholders of various sorts who may not themselves be programmers or coders. Uh, since we unveiled this feature at the summit uh, last year in preview forum, we've had users create thousands of these applications, and we've been adding a few new capabilities, things like the ability to bring in uh, data layers that you have uh, written out to cloud storage, so you can have very, very fast uh, user experiences with these apps. Uh, and one of the things that we've heard uh, most strongly, uh, and that you'll see some previews of uh, if you attend the several classes on this topic this week, uh, is the ability also coming soon to control access to these apps or access controlled data. Uh, so going beyond just the public apps uh, that we've had uh, for some time now. Um, so, Rebecca alluded to one of the biggest areas of work for us uh, over the last year, and this is a very exciting area. I think you're gonna see a lot more coming in the year to come as well, and that's the marriage of Earth Engine and TensorFlow uh, for applying uh, machine learning techniques, deep learning to remote sensing and uh, Earth science problems. Uh, so we've been hard at work over the last year working with several partners who are here in this room who've been really on the bleeding edge, crawling over the broken glass that Rebecca alluded to, uh, helping understand uh, really what are the best practices uh, and how can we uh, build additional tools into Earth Engine to make it much easier for you to uh, be successful in training models and then applying them at scale in a geospatial context. Uh, so we have a whole series uh, of classes on this topic uh, this week. There's TensorFlow 1 and 2, uh, there's a whole class on ML best practices, and there's a whole class dedicated to neural segmentation, which is what the, in, the, in the lingo, uh, that how we describe essentially classification on a per pixel basis. Uh, and uh, you'll learn about some of the tools and the best practices that we've been building over the last year. Uh, so this is an example of uh, impervious surface mapping using what's called a fully convolutional neural network. Uh, we have uh, examples, uh, a, a variety of examples that show sort of workflows uh, from end to end uh, using best practices. One of the things that we've learned, so the idea going into this was that the computer vision community has been incredibly successful in applying these tools and techniques. Uh, many people started by taking those models and applying them directly to remote sensing problems. That kind of works. It turns out that it works much better if you start with a model that was actually designed and purpose-built uh, to work with uh, this sort of data. And so we've been working hard on both pre-building those models so you can use them uh, in a transfer learning setting uh, and just capturing those best practices. So you'll learn about that uh, more throughout the week. As you go to scale those techniques, one of the things that you encounter uh, very quickly is a variety of scaling challenges. Uh, and we've been working hard to combine the power of Earth Engine on TensorFlow with the power of Cloud's AI platform, which is Google's general purpose, uh, large scale machine learning platform, uh, in order to help address some of those scaling challenges. Uh, so uh, you can use Cloud AI Platform as a place to train your models, taking advantage uh, not only of CPUs or GPUs, but also uh, Google's custom tensor processing units or TPUs. Uh, one of the most exciting things that we're unveiling right now uh, is the ability to then, once you've got a model there, bring that directly back into the Earth Engine environment. Uh, so we have a new concept in Earth Engine, the ee.model uh, object, and you can point that at uh, a model that you've hosted in Cloud AI Platform, and you can now apply it interactively or in batch computation settings directly from within Earth Engine, much like any other trained classifier, so you can quickly see how it performs in various places in the world, play with inputs, and so forth. Lasso's happy. We also have a bunch of tools uh, to help you assemble a model to host in this form uh, in a way that sort of embodies all the right best practices. We have a blog, blog post that came out while you were all sitting here uh, that gives some uh, insight into this, but the classes through the week are gonna be the best place to learn. Uh, now, 
If you're training a model uh, in TensorFlow, you're probably working in Python, uh, and the best environment to do that is really going to be in a Python notebook like Colab. Uh, so we've been doing several things to help make that flow uh, easier. Uh, one thing is just that we have a bunch of example notebooks now. Uh, we have just released three new notebooks that are end-to-end uh, -end machine learning uh, notebooks that take advantage of Cloud AI Platform, TensorFlow, and Earth Engine together. Um, and uh, we've been working to make the, uh, the process of getting up and running using Colab and Earth Engine even easier. And that actually generalizes to all Python users. So we've recently unveiled uh, uh, completely new Python installation instructions that make it much easier to get started with Python and Earth Engine. Uh, and we have uh, uh, released a Conda package for those of you who, who are, are using Conda in your Python environment, make it very easy to get started. Um, and you can learn about that in some classes here as well. Finally, more, more or less finally, uh, our integration with Cloud AI Platform is really just one piece of a much larger set uh, of integrations that we're building with tools across the Cloud Platform family. Uh, so, you know, since the beginning, you've been able to upload data into and out of Earth Engine through cloud storage. We've been partnering with BigQuery, Cloud AI Platform, as I just mentioned. Uh, but this is really uh, a, a, an effort to bring Earth Engine into that much larger ecosystem in a more complete way. As part of that, we've also been modernizing Earth Engine's own tech stack, migrating it over to some of Google's latest and greatest uh, AI serving capabilities. Uh, and uh, we have now a new, what's called a REST API, that's the, the lingo in the web development space, for an API that you can use uh, to uh, make calls to Earth Engine from any language, uh, and you'll uh, hear about that in a, in a class this week where you can get preview access to that API and learn about what you can do to access data, for example, from Earth Engine uh, elsewhere in Cloud Platform, uh, or be able to puppet Earth Engine from languages other than JavaScript or Python. Um, lastly, Earth Engine is a complex uh, ecosystem. Uh, we understand that, uh, and we've been trying to, to uh, make it easier for folks to get help and get up to speed. Uh, so I should call out that we have uh, recently overhauled uh, the get help section of our documentation with new instructions for to sort of clarify how you can best tap into the expertise both of Googlers and of the broader Earth Engine community. As that community has scaled, we've begun shifting our attention slowly uh, over to the uh, GIS uh, area of Stack Exchange, uh, where community members can uh, help answer questions and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and finally, uh, because so many of you have so much expertise uh, on how to use Earth Engine for a range of things, uh, we've just assembled an exciting uh, new community tutorials page on GitHub, where a number of folks in this room have helped seed that, but uh, you can actually attend a class this week where you can learn about how you can get involved uh, in sharing the best practices that you've developed uh, with your communities uh, openly through GitHub. Uh, it's also just a great place to see some end-to-end -end flows and get some inspiration. Uh, so I think that about does it. I am uh, the last thing, I think, standing between you and your lunch, but uh, Raleigh will confirm. And thank you all, and have an amazing week. Okay, he is right, but really I'm the last thing standing between you and your lunch, so I'll try to be brief. Um, so we're about to break into lunch from 11.30 to 12.30.